This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to this special kids session here from the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. We are talking specifically to little Olivia today who is aged four to six. I'm not sure how that works. She probably has a specific age in between four and six. Hello Olivia, nice to have you with us. Where we have started a giraffe. Well we have started with a giraffe for you. We haven't started a giraffe. That would be like saying we'd started the species, which of course would be ridiculous. You can ask us any questions you like, as long as they relate to wildlife, or biology in general. We'll do our best to answer them for you. Hello, Olivia. You want to know why giraffes have long necks? Well, that is a good question. It is the most... Uh, well, I don't want to say obvious question in a way that sounds like I think it's not a good question. It's a very good question. The reason giraffes have long necks is basically so that they can reach up into the trees and get food. Now, there's a little bit of discussion that says giraffes have got long necks actually because it helps them to fight. And over the course of many thousands of years, their necks have got longer and longer because the longer the neck is, the easier it is for the giraffe to fight. I personally think that that's garbage. I think that they've got long necks to help them reach up into the trees. And there's an ox pecker on that one's head. You can see that. And he's now in the process of relieving himself. Righty. My friend Lauren is around pretty close by and she's with some other common plains animals of Africa. We have, we have, we have wildebeest for you all this afternoon. Good afternoon and of course welcome to your live safari. Wherever you may be in the world, the first 45 minutes is dedicated to all you kids. My name is Lauren, I do have Owen on camera and on this very, very hot afternoon we are enjoying watching all the animals, of course, seek shade, which is exactly what I would love to be doing, but sadly we don't have any shade so we have to enjoy the sun. Now on a day like today, most of the animals will be trying to avoid the heat. It's far too hot to be exposed to the sun all the time. So they will either go to water bodies or, of course, they will head into shade like our wildebeest are doing right now. We also have impala here. I'm sure Owen will show you some impala. And both of these animals are herbivores. They're different species, but they're herbivores. And therefore, they're able to coexist in one another's space. I wouldn't use the word friends, but they're always around one another. And essentially, that's a good thing. It means if the impala spot any danger, they can let the wildebeest know. If the wildebeest spot any danger, they can let the impala know. So it's a win-win situation. And that's why you will always find them in the same area together. Olivia, yes sir. Ah, we do have wild dogs here. African wild dogs and they are fantastic animals. Sadly, we don't see them every single day, but we do see them out here and they're very, very endangered. They're the second most endangered carnivore in Africa. And they look a little bit like dogs that we know, but of course they're not. They're not similar to the domestic dogs that we have at home. They're completely different, completely wild. And unfortunately, they do have a slightly bad reputation. And that's why many, many conservation bodies in Libya are actually trying to change the name from wild dog to painted wolf. But I think wild dog is a great name. I think it's awesome. But of course, many people think that it's a little bit negative, so they're trying to change the name. Painted wolf because the modern on the coat looks like someone taken a paintbrush and painted all over the dog. 
So for now, we're going to rumble on forward and we're going to send you back across to James and see what has for you now. We've got an elephant here. He was just having a little swim, but unfortunately it looks like his swim is finished. Oh, he's been having the best time. Just like you might if you had been swimming. Hello, Brody, Cade, Bowen and Wade. You were all hoping to see elephants. Well, you're in luck. There is a, an elephant. That's a young bull elephant. And he's just had a lovely swim. So it's quite a hot day, about 29 degrees Celsius, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. He might not now start throwing mud on himself, which will be quite funny. They like to do that. There we go, he's just picking some mud up and throwing it on himself. See how he digs it up with his feet first? He's having a lovely time now. That mud is nice and cool on his body. So he feels nice and almost as if he's being covered in a beautiful soft covering of cool, well, cool mud really. Doesn't he look like he's having a lovely time? I think he looks like he's having the best time. I quite like to go and roll in the mud sometimes myself. might also be able to see I've forgotten what I was going to say now never mind it's just oh what I wanted to say was you might be able to hear a bird going sounds like a Wahlberg's eagle to me I don't know how long he's going to be there. We'll see. Sometimes they like to do it for quite a long time. Sometimes they just move on. Well, Edward, you say the trunk-foot coordination is awesome, and you're probably sort of being semi, semi-jokey semi about it, not facetious, but, you know, but you're absolutely right. It is awesome, because if they weren't like that, 
if they weren't able to do that, they'd stand all over their trunks, and of course that would be a disaster for them. To stand on their trunks would be hopeless. And so it's quite nice that they don't, for them. Oh, it's just beautiful watching him like this. <laughs> no, Henry, they don't. That's a really good question. You say they put mud on every day. No, they normally don't, actually. They normally put mud on only um, on days when it's hot. And so it's been quite hot today, but not very hot. And so he's put mud on, that's why he's done that. And now he'll go off and probably have something nice to eat. I suspect. He'll find himself some grass. Uh, Hildy, elephants can lie down. Little ones do lie down quite a lot. But you'll find that the bigger ones don't. And the reason the bigger ones don't too much, I mean, they do sometimes, but not very often. And the reason that they don't is that their, their organs are so heavy inside their bodies that they tend to crush each other. So if they lie down, um, you know, it tends to get very uncomfortable very quickly. That makes sense. No, Isabella, <laughs> that's an interesting one. You know, they don't wash the mud off themselves. They like the mud on their skin, and it's not unhealthy for them. It's not like if you go and wallow around in the mud and then try to go to bed afterwards and leave your sheets covered in muck, because we're not really designed to be like that. We need to be clean in order to be healthy. Whereas animals like that, actually derive a health benefit from being covered in mud, which is quite nice. What can you see, David? Some geese. Yeah, Egyptian ghouls. David, who is on camera, has spotted an elephant ghouls. What was that, Kirsten? Ah, oh, apparently there was another elephant. It's gone now. So that's really nice. Ah, now Lauren has found the next mammal. I have found a stunning, very handsome mammal who has just decided to walk off. But I'm sure we can still see him. This is a kudu. And he's surrounded by impalas, but he is not an impala. He's a kudu. And he's absolutely magnificent. Look at those horns. Only the males have horns. So it's very, very easy to tell the difference between males and females. Oh, he's currently having lunch. A late lunch. Mmm. Delicious. Oh, looks great. And he's the biggest of the antelope species that we get out here. Kudus get very large. The females are large too, but the bulls, the boys, they get very, very large. It's a lot of muscle power behind them. And of course, they've got those fantastic, gorgeous horns that they can use for self-protection. <laughs> Good afternoon. I think this chap is very, very hungry. And Owen, if we can just take a look at this impala to his right, that's a male impala with horns. So you can see that the shapes of the impala horns are very, very different from the kudu horns. And again, with impala, the females do not have horns. They're completely different 
designs for Kudu and Impala. I think he's feeling slightly shy. Let's just see if the Kudu pops back out again. And again, just like the wildebeest and the impala, they're not enemies. Friends is maybe not the best word, but they stick together. It's beneficial for them to be together. Protection against predators. Olivia, lions eat these animals. That's their Lions are predators, they're actually the apex predators out here. And the animals that you're looking at, Pala, Wildebeest, Kudu, they're all herbivores. And what herbivores mean, Olivia, is that they eat vegetation, they eat grass, and they eat leaves, and they eat plants. Whereas lions are carnivores, just like leopards and your wild dogs and your hyenas and your chaff. What that means is they eat meat, they eat other animals. So therefore the carnivores will unfortunately eat the herbivores. The impala and the kudu, you're looking at right now, are herbivores. So the lions will hunt them. But every animal out here in the animal kingdom must eat. So it seems like James is a man of mission day and he's found another great sign for you. We have found the hippopotamus. There it is, the hippopotamus. And I'm rather hoping that this hippopotamus is going to give a dis display. He was doing a really nice display a little earlier on. He opened up his mouth and he waved it about and it was really quite impressive. So I'm hope he's going to, I hope he's going to do that for us again. Let's see if he does. In the meantime, we'll just enjoy him. You can still hear the Wahlberg's eagle going. Now that Wahlberg's eagle, while we're looking at the hippo, while we are waiting for the hippo to perform, I'll tell you that the Wahlberg's eagle is quite an impressive animal because he will be leaving soon and going on a very long flight all the way up to Central Africa because that's where he'll live during our winter time. I'm just going to talk to Lauren quickly on the radio. Go ahead. Ooh, and there are lots of oxpeckers landing on the hippopotamus there. They're hoping to get a bit of blood off him. So hippos have often got little injuries on them from fighting or getting scratched in the bushes when they're feeding at night. And then the oxpeckers will go and drink the blood that comes out of those wounds. might also be able to hear the Birchall's starling going quack, 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 quack. Taylor, the reason that the birds drink blood is that they like blood. That's what they like to drink. It's the same reason that you eat ice cream. You like it. I suppose the difference between ice cream and blood for the oxpeckers is that the blood is quite good for them. Whereas ice cream, of course, is not very good for you.
I really hope he does this thing again. We'll give him a little bit longer because it was so impressive to watch. He sat back on his haunches, opened his mouth and waved it around. It was a lovely picture. But as you can see at the moment, he's not doing anything. Let's give him a little bit of time though. No. Brody, you're age seven and you're absolutely right. The hippo don't care nothing for the fact that there is a bird sitting on his back. In fact, he quite likes it because sometimes he's got parasites like ticks on his back and he needs the oxpecker to eat those off him. And so sometimes it's quite useful for him. Here we go. There we go. Isn't that cool? Hooray! I'm so glad we got that. Now what he's saying there to all the other animals around here is that this is my spot. He's not actually yawning. He's just showing everybody that this is his spot and that nobody else must come here because this is where he lives and this is his water. Cool, hey? And I think that'll probably be the end of his display for now. Good, I think we'll carry on. I'm glad we were patient about that. You've got to be patient with wildlife, because if you aren't, often you don't get it to see anything. Let's go back to Laura now and see where she's heading and what she's going to find. Very good point, James. I think I'm going to head to a dam of my own. I'm going to head to a dam called Treehouse Dam. Normally there's lots of activity around that area and once it gets a little bit cooler, it's very hot right now, we're probably going to check in on a new mama hyena. Yes. Our hyena called Ribbon has just given birth to two beautiful little cubs. So I think once it gets a little bit cooler, not now, I will end up checking on her just to say hello. It's nice to check on her every day and get an up on the cub's progress. We're going to, oh, sorry, it's rather bumpy. We're going to get a sort of day by day developmental view of how these cubs are getting bigger and bigger. So I'm very excited for that, but I think now I am going to go to a dam and see if we can find maybe any other animals that could be having a drink. If I was a mammal today, I would be at a water hole, either swimming like the elephants or I would be having a drink. Now this is our last little bit of summer out here in the African bush fell. You can see everything so green and so rich and I think we maybe have about a month left of summer and then things will really start to change out here for us. So I'm trying to enjoy every bit of summer that we can. Olivia, you're asking why do cheetahs have spots, black spots? Very similar to leopards, Olivia, it actually helps some camouflage. Now, I know you maybe think, really? But I can see them so easily. Yes, we can. But when they're moving through the thicket and they're moving through the long grass or possibly even the thick vegetation, it's actually really, really difficult to see a leopard and a cheetah because these spots break up that body's outline. It's a very, very clever technique that allows them to blend into the background. It makes them not look like an animal. And we say, Olivia, that it breaks up the outline of the body. So although we see the spots and we think it looks beautiful, because it is, it's very obvious, when the animal is moving in the long grass, it's actually very difficult to see them. So it's their way of camouflage, I guess. It blends them into the background. Predators don't want to be seen. 
they act on the element of surprise. They need to sneak up on the prey and surprise them. If they were always spotted, ha 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 ha, with their spots, then they would never be successful in hunting, Olivia. And they need to make sure that they're not always seen by their prey. I'm actually hoping we can find some predators today. Possibly not cheetah. We don't get many cheetah around here. If we found cheetah, then it would be a very, very lucky day. But I am hoping we can find a leopard. I haven't seen any leopard in a very long time and I'm missing them a lot. Well, not a long, long time, but a long time for out here. We know all the leopards. We know them by name. We recognize them. We know who they are where they come from and when we go a few days without seeing them I have to say I miss them a lot so I'm almost at the dam I'm really hoping that we've got some animals there for you but it seems like James has got an impala ram we do have an impala ram and it's shouting at something but there's another impala ram and it's not shouting. So normally when they shout like that, they've seen a predator. But there are two of them there. One of them is not shouting. I think it's worth us going to have a look. He's not looking at his friend. He's looking over the other side there. Maybe there's a predator. Why are you shouting in palace? What can we see down here? Is there a sign of a cat, a leopard or a lion or a hyena? They were looking through here, but only one of them was shouting. Olivia, you're wondering why boy or male lions are so lazy. Well, Actually, they are lazy, but so are the female or girl lions. They're also very lazy. They sleep for a long time every day, and it's because they only eat meat. So they don't eat anything with sugar in it, which means that it's quite difficult for them to find enough energy to move around. And that's why they're so lazy. It's actually not really fair to call only boy lions lazy because Lady lions are often just as lazy. I think that impala was not seeing clearly. I think he saw something that he thought may have been a predator, but it wasn't. Samantha, you say come on spots. You're hoping for a leopard, obviously, Samantha. Just drive down this away. Let's see if anything didn't pop along the road here. Wouldn't hmm? Wouldn't it be exciting if we came across a kitty? grass is so long though. I don't see anything I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm not convinced they were shouting at anything simply because only one of them was shouting. So let's carry on. We're going to go off to a waterhole and Lauren has arrived at another waterhole. I have arrived at Treehouse Dam and we're trying to show you a little terrapin. I can see it again, Owen. This is a reptile. We've been speaking a lot about mammals, so I thought I'm going to try and show you a reptile. And it's a marsh terrapin that spends all its day, well, just chilling in the water. There you go. It's disappeared again. It's gone underneath. But they breathe air just like us. We've not got a scuba tank. 
they don't have an inbuilt scuba tank and therefore every so often they need to come up to the surface to breathe. So I think this little guy will probably come up again. Maybe if, ah, he's there Owen, let's go forward. I love reptiles. I really, really love them. I think they're very, very awesome. And turtles, terrapins, tortoises, snakes, lizards, geckos, bearded dragons, iguanas, they're all in the same group known as reptiles. Ah, what I would do to be a terrapin right now and be in that water. Or maybe not that water. It is filled with lots of elephant dung and hippo poop, but I would like to be in water right now. And James could hear the impalas alarming. That's very interesting. I'm sure he told you, but impalas are normally very, very vocal when they see a predator. So I hope there's a predator around and I really, really hope James can find it. Sometimes the impalas will be full of beans. Brody, you are age seven. Wow. And you are watching Wild Earth. You're watching all of us here driving around in the sun trying to find you animals. And yes, we do have a cool job. I love it very, very much. And you know why I love it, Brody? Because I learn something new every day. I don't know everything. I don't think anyone knows everything. And I learn something new every day. And not only do I learn, but I get it to share it with all of you. And when you're older, Brody, you will have to get a job, I'm afraid. And just make sure you choose something that you really, really enjoy. Something that you're passionate about and something that you can learn something new every single day. If you're not learning, then it's not worth it. Shall we keep driving, Owen? Our little terrapin keeps disappearing. It's not making it easy for us. Sometimes it's challenging out here. We have our moments, but yes, it's a very cool job, Brody. And it makes it cooler because you are actually watching us as we do it. So it's very quiet at the dam here. I think I am going to have a look at another dam known as Twin Dams. So as I bumble my way there, we're going to send you back across to James and let's see where he is heading now. We are headed towards a waterhole called Biffles Hook Waterhole or Biffles Hook Dam, which means Buffalo Corner Dam. There hasn't been buffalo seen there for some time, but maybe today we'll be lucky. <laughs> Hello Henry, you're quite a clever fellow, you've obviously seen leopards before and you say why do they take their prey up into trees? It's not only their leftovers, they'll take f uneaten prey into trees and that's because lions and hyenas will steal their food from them and so in order to avoid having their food stolen by lions and hyenas they take their food up into trees, which is quite clever really, wouldn't you say? Yes, another good question from Tesla age 9, do birds stop to rest when they migrate? They absolutely do, yes. They don't just fly the whole way. Uh, well, some birds can sleep in the air. Swifts, some species of swift can sleep in the air. They shut down half the brain and sort of half sleep and then wake up that side and shut down the other half. You can't really understand that because we can't do that, you know, so we don't really know what that feels like. Some birds can do that. And then some birds, like uh, an albatross, some albatross species will be in the air for, oh, I think it's years at a time, sometimes over a year. You know, they rest in the wind and they must be able to sleep slightly like that. But a lot of birds, like barn swallows, for example, will take about six weeks to get from here to Europe and they will definitely rest every night on the way. They will seldom fly during the night, so they'll stop to roost every night. And a lot of birds will do that. The little warblers that do it and the eagles also will rest. So some do and some don't, but mostly they do, I think, especially the little ones. You know, something like a 
a willow warbler or a barn swallow, they don't, you know, they're, they're designed to move quickly in the air. They're not designed to glide like an eagle is or like an albatross is. And that means that it's, it's you know, it takes a lot of energy for them to fly big distances. And so they must rest. They can't just float in the air like those eagles and albatrosses can. I'm just driving very slowly through here because the bush is very thick and we don't want to miss out on or anything else that might be lurking here. And our signal is not great, so we're going to speed up a bit and you're going to go to Lauren. Yes, James, speed up and get your signal back. We are almost, well, actually, we're not almost. We're a little bit far away from our second dam, but I'm just looking to see what I can find along the way. So our job out here involves looking around to see if we can see any animals, looking up for birds. We, of course, look at the birds too. They're very, very important. Looking down at the ground for tracks. Now, I don't know if Owen's able to there's actually really not that many tracks, antelope tracks and car tires. Not very exciting, but sometimes you will see leopard tracks or lion tracks or hyenas or even wild dogs. And it gives you a sense of what's happening and where the animals are. If it's a leopard, you can actually follow the leopard tracks all the way along. And sometimes you get very, very lucky and you will find a leopard at the end of it, essentially. That's what you want. You want to find the animal animal at the end of all your tracking. I also use my nose. It's very blocked right now, I'm afraid. But normally when it's not blocked, I use my nose to try and smell the environment. Sometimes you can actually smell the animals. Normally I can smell both elephants and lions before I find them. If I find them. But I can always smell them. They are the two animals whose scent fills my nostrils. Elephants is delightful. But I have to say, the scent of a lion, not so much, I'm afraid. Not the most delightful smell I have ever encountered. Olivia, great question. Just like the impalas and the kudu, the males have the horns, but the females do not because they don't need to. Olivia, so they don't need to waste all the energy on growing a set of horns and maintaining them and just generally having heavy horns on your head. Exact same reason as lions grow manes. We call them manes and it's to make them magnificent and to attract the females. So what the males try to do is compete with other males and say, hey, look at me. Look at my great big mane. Isn't it fabulous? Choose me. And it attracts the females. And of course, with lions, the longer and fuller the mane and darker the mane, they are said to be more successful with the females because they're a better and stronger male. Some people think that lions also have mane. They have lots of hair around their sort of shoulder and neck area, and it helps protect their shoulders and neck when they're fighting. But I don't think a tuft of hair could do that much protection when you're battling with another male lion. So normally, it's to ensure that you can attract the ladies. It's all about competition. Most animals out here compete with one another. <gasps> Brody again! You're age seven and your favorite animal is an elephant. I can see why. I love elephants. I was actually hoping to have found an elephant for you by now, but... James did, of course. We've already ticked that one off our safari list, and you are asking me what my favorite animal is. Ah, oh, Brody, I find that such a tough question, but if I had to choose, I have two. Am I allowed to have two? One is a leopard. I love the leopards. I didn't used to. I have completely fallen in love with leopards. And... Sorry, I think someone is talking on my other radio. Hyenas. I really, really love hyenas. At first, I didn't know that much about hyenas, and then I got to learn all. Really, really cool. very smart. They're very intelligent. 
and they're very, very cool animals. So I think hyenas and leopards aren't my favorite, but I love them all, Brody. I do love elephants too. I love lions. I love wild dogs. I love snakes. I love turtles. I love birds. I love them all. But that's a really good question, Brody. And I think when we next go back across to James, we should actually ask him what his favorite animal is. We are now arriving at a... Oh! Fantastic. Should we go... Sorry? My mic's bombing. Sorry about that. I'd, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, let's go up onto the wall. There we go. We've got more swimming elephant, which is always exciting. Patience, the oldest living animal roaming the safari today. Uh, I don't know. I suspect it's probably a tortoise. Kirsten, who's in the final control, is not very funny. She says, I'm the oldest thing roaming the safari today. She's talking garbage, of course, but that's just what she does. So, it's probably a tortoise. Some of our tortoises can live for more than a hundred years. And so that's what I think. Other than me, a tortoise. I am 350 years old. Isn't that impressive? If you eat your vitamins and your spinach, you too can live to be 350 years old, like me. Um, do you know what the oldest living animal in the world is? If I'm not mistaken, the oldest living animal in the world is a Greenland shark, which literally can live about 350 years, I think. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. A Greenland shark. Unfortunately, we got here just slightly too late because the elephants were having a great time in the water, but I think they've now finished having their swim. Sometimes they come back. Let's drive a little further along here. Maybe they'll come back. disappearing into that bush. See how we can't see them anymore, how quickly the most enormous animal on the safari has just disappeared into the bushes. And we can't see them anymore. It's always good to just sit at the water for a little while and see if something else doesn't come down. The squadron of Brontosaurus perhaps, or something like that. Olivia, your last question is, why are monkeys' tails so soft? Olivia, um, I'm not sure that they are so soft. I think they're quite hard, actually. Some monkeys can even hold themselves in the branches with their tails, so I don't think they are soft. Some of them have got some soft fur on them, but in actual fact, they're really not that soft. There go the elephants. Like ships like grey ships floating in a sea of green bush. All right, kids, it's been lovely having you with us. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you're A, staying healthy, and B, observing all the rules that will keep you healthy. We'll see you next time.
Good afternoon and welcome to the remainder part of the drive. That is for everyone now, not just for children. And we are looking at a fully grown male here. Oh, well, I'm trying to who is acting like a great child in a pool of water. My name is Lauren, I do have Owen on camera, and over here we have something magnificent, a huge buffalo chillaxing. On this very hot day, I have completely forgotten the temperatures, as usual, but it's hot. It's very, very hot, and I am feeling it, and clearly this buffalo is feeling it too. 29 degrees Celsius and 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you, Christian. Now, Brody, I know you're still watching. I know you will be. And although I am being blinded by the sun, your mama is awesome. And thank you for both of your support, your mama and you. We're very, very happy to have you watching us here right now. Always happy to get questions from the adults and the kids. This is such a lovely moment. I really didn't expect. I'm actually at Lauren's pan. You can probably hear it. I hope you can hear it. And I really didn't expect to see this buffalo here. Okay, maybe there's a slight chance that we're on this Mahindra that you might actually not hear Lawrence Pan, but we are going to pull up there in a little bit. I just thought, how wonderful. I think this is a lone dagger boy. Chewing the cud, as they say, and just relaxing. I haven't seen a herd of buffalo in a few days now. I don't know where the herd that we had on the property disappeared to. But clearly we have one. Now my plan for today is really just to bumble around. I am in the Mahindra, a.k.a. Squeaky Pig. Oh, oxpeckers have arrived. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, descended. I saw an eye roll. I think that buffalo just eye rolled. But yes, I'm just going to bumble in all the areas that we can. And once it gets a little bit cooler, I am going to go back and check on Ribbon. I know James was there this morning and I really hoped he would get a glimpse of the cubs so he could introduce himself. But I just want to pop in for a short time. I think every day if we just pop our nose in, it's going to give us great insight into the clan, into the cubs development, into so many things that we maybe wouldn't get to see otherwise. Oh, that oxpecker is going straight into the... I suck it. Ouchie. Ouchie, ouchie. And of course, the debate on ox, peck ox peckers is still ongoing in science. Are they mutually symbiotic with the animals that they obviously pluck ticks off? Or are they little vampires? They do pluck ticks off, yes. There's also a lot of evidence now that says they really do continue to suck blood. So if there's an open wound, or maybe they, they draw blood from the tick when they pull it out too harshly, they're also said to keep digging their beaks in and in and in and keeping wounds open in order to get the blood. And therefore, they do more damage than good. They don't allow the animal to heal. And of course, open wounds can promote infection. So are they really beneficial to their host? Or are they little vampires? And it's a great discussion. Are they both? Oxpeckers are an essential part of the ecosystem, but yeah, Curse thinks both. Essentially, I guess I do too. Maybe they're trying to be balanced and they're trying to help their host. But then once they get a taste for that blood, they can't help it. So they don't mean to keep the wounds open. I'm not sure. But it's a great debate in science at the moment, the role of ox peckers. So yes, I've been working on a huge hyena map for y'all. It's not quite finished, but it's almost finished. And I will be bringing it with me on my next drive. And it's going to detail who is related to who, who was born when, who all the males are, who's missing, when the dates of the, those missing ones were last seen, who we presume dead, who we know is dead, and so forth. So I'm not quite finished. I thought I would have it finished by today. But I shall have that on my next drive for you all. And we shall sit at the hyena den and go through it. So, Mr. Beefalo, I'm going to let you enjoy your spa day. You seem to thoroughly enjoy it. And it seems like Mr. Hendry has got another animal most likely having a spa day. 
Yes, this animal is definitely having a spa day. It is, of course, a hippopoptamus. And this particular hippopoptamus is lying under the shade of that tree. But if you look very carefully there, ah, can you just, can you see it, Dov? There's another hippopoptamus there, a tiny baby hippopoptamus is lying also in the shade of that tree. You could just see it there. Kirsten says she can see its ear. There we are. It is very shy. It's very afraid. It's very afraid to be part of this show. But I don't think it needs to be. I think it should be happy to be part of our show. I thought I'd seen a tiny, tiny one here the other day, and so I had. Otherwise, the elephants are still off in the bush there. I can hear them knocking about the place. They are not coming to say hello to us any further, which isn't very nice of them, but you know, they can't be expected to perform all the time. Thank you, Disney girl. You say you love hippos and baby hippos are adorable. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I love hippos too, and I think baby hippos are very adorable. But otherwise, I think we're going to have to move on from here. There is not a great deal going on. Oh, we're going to go across to the favorite duck with Lauren. <laughs> the favorite duck. Yes, one of the favorites, I have to say. It's not my favorite, but I believe it is a favorite. And we are at Lauren's pan. I haven't been here in quite some time actually I'm quite ashamed to say but this is a white faced whistling duck and it's very very beautiful of course you can identify it from the white face yes believe it or not my favorite duck is a knob billed duck I just love them I think they're fantastic and also slightly ridiculous at the same time but these are the white faced whistling ducks now I'm hoping you can maybe pick up on a little bit of the ambient sounds of all the weavers here. Of course, we are using the bush walk backpack. Kirst has just confirmed that you can, so I'm gonna go silent for a little moment or two so that you can all enjoy this. I've actually just noticed more buffalo. This little guy here is not on his own. The rest of the herd are across Gowrie Main, shall we?
the beefaloes. Now I can see one, another one. Maybe it's not quite the entire herd, but let's go and take a look. Yesterday I actually discovered and I have to say I still can't put the pieces together but I really do believe it was a Torchwood pride. Oh, apparently I'm losing my signal so for now let's send you back across to James. We're still at the dam. We were hoping that maybe something else would emerge and come and show us something, but it has not. And so I think we shall probably continue on our merry way and see what else we can find as we drive. Here we go. No, no, I'm afraid I, I didn't get that. Did you get it, David? Yes. What was it? Old bird. <laughs> Old bird, yes? <laughs> Good question, Old bird. <laughs> Hippos uh, have a much lower energy requirement than all other herbivores of similar size, and that's, of course, because they sit around in the water doing nothing all day and so when they come out of the water all they have to do is fill themselves up with a little bit of grass and then they don't really have to do much more than that because they spend probably 16 hours of the day not even having to hold up their own body mass and the same goes I mean it's not only the elephants that eat a lot more than they do rhino do as well so you'll find that Rhinoceros eat about, I think it's about 40 kilos of food a day, a bull rhino, and a hippopotamus probably eats in the region of 20 to 25. So they just don't have the same energy requirements as the other big grey animals. There is a laughing dove on the road, David. Look at it. Look at it, if I tell you, look at it. So called because it makes a laughing noise. I cannot make the laughing noise, Kirsten. It goes something like this. I will try it. It goes. Ma! Ma! Sounds something like that. In fact, almost exactly like that. <coughs> Louise in, in Final Control said, Really? Yes, Louise, really. It's true. I tell you, it's true. You mean Tommy Shelby, yes. Tommy Shelby. Quite a sweet little bird, isn't it? It is the impala of the sky, really. I think 21st century superstar, you might be giving the dove a compliment it doesn't quite deserve. So majestic. He's not something I'd use to uh, describe that dove, I must say. I might describe it as uh, peaceful relatively interesting but I think so majestic is perhaps not a compliment it deserves although I have no problem with you calling it so majestic <laughs> yes that's how I feel about it Melinda you say you love this bird so sweet no, I agree Exactly right. 
Yeah, an elephant has made an enormous poop. Barry, you think my laughing sounded like an opera singer? I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. But thank you. Most likely an insult, says Kirsten, but that's just because she spends now 24-7 insulting me. It's her role in my life. Insult me and keep me, keep me honest. Lest my narcissistic tendencies get the better of me. No chance of that happening, let me tell you, with my little piranha fish. trying to see where these elephants we had went and if they won't pop out here and give us a nice relaxing time with them as they feed. It's astounding how an elephant can disappear in this bush. Krista, um, yeah, pretty much. Hyenas, lions, and leopards are the only animals that get gets named. That are the only animals that get named out here. That's pretty much how it works. Uh, we do have a few elephants that we name because they're really obviously the same ones, if you know what I mean. So we've got Fang, who's got her recurved Fang, big tusk that's recurved, and we've got Short Trunk, who's got all together now, yep, that's correct, a short trunk. But otherwise, everything else tends to not get themselves a name. Naming all the Impala, for example, would be difficult. Because, well, they're just difficult to tell apart, really. We did have one Impala that we named, it was named Nelson, because he, <laughs> he lost one eye. Nelson, I think, was eaten on account of the fact that he couldn't see any threats coming from the left. Elephants were in here. I'm not going to spend too long looking around here for them. We'll move on. <laughs> Lovely fresh smell of sea fly. Apparently my microphone's making a horrible noise. Naturally, the most uneven ground that we have. I suppose I could just stop and do it, hey? <laughs> How's that, David? Sounds good for now. Does that sound all right? Good. The olifant has not come this way. There they are. I see them, David. You see them? Large grey ships floating through the sea of green bush. We'll try and place them in a position where they are filmable. One of them is giving us a bit of a what for. Now, I'm not particularly terrified of this elephant because it is a young bull and therefore unlikely to try and kill us. If that was a very big bull or a very big cow, I would be tempted to extract myself from the situation. As it is, I think he's just trying to show us that he's very big and strong. Now, 
Fry doesn't know what to do because we happen to run away in terror. Oh, he's decided that he's... Fox, you say, what a beauty, and Kirsten was just pointing out that you probably mean the elephant and not me. I think that's fair enough, Fox. I don't think I'm much of a beauty myself. I'll tell you a story about that. I am... Um, there used to be a... There used to be a, a sort of fashion show at a school that raised money for the matric dance competition, or for the matric dance, which is basically like the prom. And um, I entered every year I was at school, and I never made the finals. Can you believe it, David? I did win an award one year, though, for the most consistent entrant, which I thought was nice. There are three elephants here. Yeah? young bulls. I'll try and get into a decent position to have a view of them. In the meanwhile, let's go back to Lauren. Well done on finding the elephants, James. You have done a lot better than I have. I had decided to do a little bit of a boundary patrol because there's not many vehicles moving at, moving the, at the minute. There's not, I think there's one other person on the game drive. We're not getting the information that we used to. So sometimes when you come to a boundary like Dowry Main, the one we're on right now in the south, I am going to sneeze everyone, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Why me? So yes, we may get some signs of somebody moving. And that's what I'm hoping to check. And then we're going to cut in and take the long way around to the high end. Definitely not what we're looking for. I do, I think I was saying this to Javi the other day, I am finding it fascinating how the leopards, especially our leopards, the Juma leopards, are definitely not being as vocal or as visible of late. I must say that. Not had any sawing on the dam cam in quite a while, quite a few days. No signs of Klalamba, no word on Tandy. Oh, Kirstis just told me there was a leopard sewing on a tan camp this morning. I did not know that. I wasn't out this morning, I'm afraid. Oh, somewhere reckoning it was Hukamuri. I wish I had that information. Okay, well, I'm heading west anyway. It just happens to be the direction that I'm heading in. So we may as well look for any signs of the hook. Now, what Hukamori tends to do, which rather annoys me, I think we need to speak to Hukamori, tell him to stop this. He tends to come in to do his territorial patrol, have a sniff around, see what's going on, see if there's any attractive ladies around, you know, and then leaves. By the morning, he's gone. He doesn't tend to spend too much time on Juma, and that's because Juma is such a small portion of his territory. His territory is very large, but what I am gonna do now, is search for signs of the hook and of course every leopard saw male leopard saw and females is different and that's how many of you can actually identify if it's Chingana, Mulawati, Hukamuri or unknown but I would really really love to see Hukamuri it's been far too long there is something about that cat that I love Oh, Puma, okay, I'm really behind on the updates today, I apologise. There was actually quite a lot of sawing throughout the night as well. Mm-hmm, someone was on territorial patrol, be it Hukumuri or Tangana, someone was obviously very busy. They saw to announce their presence, not to hide, but to announce that they're there, this is our territory, stay away. I wonder, I wonder. I think I'm going to take Zoe's. Hukumuri loves Zoe's road. And let's see if we can find any signs of a male leopard, everyone. 
but I do want to be with Ribbon just before that sun goes down because of course once it starts to get dark we leave and I want to try and see if we can get any visual of the cub and I also want an update on her she doesn't seem to be moving much and she needs she needs to drink at some point and she will need to feed because a lactating mother needs to keep up her energy levels it's very very important that she sort of keeps up her energy oh ah another update it appears ribbon fed last night good she has to she absolutely has to she probably waited a few days after birth and i'm convinced we saw the tail end of birth i'm convinced the day we saw her was the day she gave birth and she's obviously spent a few days feeding the cubs she's obviously tired herself she's exhausted i think she had enough energy i saw her the day before with tungana and she was so full so she probably used up all those energy stores and now she's feeling hungry and it seems like she fed last night which is perfect ah oh, go rib robs but she needs to stay strong and healthy and well fed in order for her milk to remain to sort of be as nutritious as it is for the little cubbies and very soon it's, it's going to take i think a matter of days before we start to see the cubs more and more and more and already we witnessed davi and i that sort of main sighting we got of the two of them an act of dominance one already seemed to be trying to exert its dominance on the other and that's normal they come out fighting i imagine they probably also fight in the womb as well and they come out with the natural instinct trying to exert their dominance one will always be more dominant than the other in twin litters and it's normally visible you watch their interactions for long enough and you can normally see which one is going to be more dominant It'll be nice to pick out features of them both as well for identification. DDJJ. I hope that name was right. It sounds like a bizarre bra size. DDJJ. I love it. I hope that's your initials. And. In terms of the females, because of course, when you talk about a hyena society, it's all about the females. That's the sort of main structure. The males are normally 97% immigrant males, which means they've joined the clan from other clans. They've left their clan, wherever it may be, they've traveled and joined the Juma clan. So in terms of the females, you have who we believe at the top now, Ribbon herself. We have her daughter in Tima. We have Hart, June and Corky. Am I forgetting anyone? No, there was six and we've lost Pretty. Ribbon and Tima, Hart, June and Corky. There was, of course, Pretty, but we believe that Pretty has passed away. The last time she was seen was with myself and she was really not in a good way. I'm not entirely sure that I could diagnose what was wrong with her, but something was very, very wrong. I don't think Pretty's made it. Pretty's offspring, however, Swazi and Indabele, also known as Belle, are still with us so the offsprings are and for the males there's sort of a group of males that we always see with the juma clan that are now said to be immigrant males we have comet fika luka kaikau koza saka and falco they are the main males that we see with the clan now that have immigrated and joined the juma clan And there's been loss along the way as well. So I'm going to go into great detail on this the next time I'm on drive. And we're going to have my big map and just try and detail to those of you who are maybe not familiar with the Juma clan. Who is related to who? How old are all these hyenas that we know of? And the lineages. And I think you'll find it very, very interesting. Now, I don't see any tracks of leopards here. So if... The Kamuri came in last night. He didn't come in via this road, that's for sure. So I'm doing a great job of driving at the moment, and I believe James Henry is doing the exact same. I am a great driver. I love being described as a driver. We've been through this before, of course. We're now driving down Cheetah Cat Line, which is the eastern boundary of Juma. To our left hand side, Torchwood plains of Torchwood where once we went and to our right 
the plains of Juma, where we go. I imagine to some of you, each individual foxglove plant must be familiar at this stage. Kitty, kitty, bang, bang, wondering about whether or not I've seen Sebwig. No, I haven't. I haven't seen Sebwig since December. I'm comfortable that Sebwig has made it through the trials of his early life and is now a fully-fledged member of the Spotted Eagle Owl Society. More evidence of elephant along here. No evidence of leopard just yet. The lions, I think, are either south of us, the Inkohoma pride, or north of us, the Talamati pride. That is probably why that buffalo has come on to Juma. It must be a buffalo of, well, just slightly above average intelligence, I suspect. It's finally cottoned on to the fact that the lions don't live here anymore. Was that Kirsten? Candace would like to know if people receive buffalo like they keep Oh, uh, Candace, they can. Some people do. Not so much. You can milk them. Uh, they do produce milk. But I don't think anybody actually keeps them for farming. They do keep them for breeding purposes. They keep them in, you know, relatively farmed states in order to breed them for their uh, big horns or to make them disease free so that you can export them and put them in other parts of you know other parks that are starting up where they can't import buffalo from this area because of the tuberculosis and corridor disease excuse me but uh, one of the reasons was I mean one of the things about buffalo is that they show a disturbing propensity to homicide and so you can't really farm them very effectively. They do tame to a certain extent but once they get past a certain age there's always a chance that they're going to stick a horn in you which is not ideal. I'm sure you'll agree and it's one of the reasons that they were never domesticated. So although human beings have lived with buffalo for millennia and millennia Buffalo were never domesticated and where the only cattle that came into Africa were descended from the Aurochs, which were of course in, where were they, they were found sort of in the Fertile Crescent. So they were domesticated because they didn't want to kill people and buffalo were left alone. I'm just looking at some footprints here of hyenas and people a person, I think, who thought that they were tracking. Yes, that's what it is. Thought they were tracking a leopard, possibly. More giraffe tracks, which is quite nice. Anyway, we'll go to the south of this particular road and then head. I guess we'll have no option but to head towards the west. Hiccups stop. The trees will start to lose their leaves in June-ish. Some around May, but probably around June. But a lot of them will only lose their leaves when the winds come in August. And then September and October is sort of major stick time. That's when you expect mostly sticks and very little by in the way of leaves. So the Cumbretums especially will retain their leaves quite late into the season, especially after we've had so much rain. The marulas will lose their leaves relatively soon. I mean, not for at least another month and a half or so. But they will lose their leaves probably before any of the others. Hmm. Yeah, it's always, I, I, I'm always surprised, you know, come the end of, or come the middle of winter, how much greenery there is. And then how much more wintry it looks once the heat of September hits us in the face. 
You know, if I was to show you a picture of this place in June versus a picture of the place in uh, September, you'd say that September was definitely during the winter. Uh, I'm just listening to the radio. So there, there are lions, and I suspect it's the Torchwood Pride, actually, or maybe the Nkuhumas, uh, just at the Cheetah Plains entrance, where we can't go. Now, obviously, these people are not driving guests. They're just the guys looking after the camps and talking to each other and driving around. We unfortunately have got an Impala only. There is an Impala. Why? Why? Do you know why they ran there? Did you see, David? It was a Diker. A Diker gave them a terrible fright and they ran away like ninnies. I don't know if anybody's ever made African buffalo mozzarella. Isabella, that's a good question. You're just six years old and you're wondering why so many animals have horns. Well, there are two reasons. One is to defend themselves from predators. So, something like a chemspok or an oryx has got big long horns and buffalo as well to help them protect themselves from predators so they'll use them to spike predators if predators try and threaten them or threaten predators and then the other reason is that they like to fight with each other so in something like impala uh, or what else diker i suppose mm, yeah diker and impala where the females, so the girls, don't have horns, you can be sure that they've got those horns because the males or the boys like to fight with each other. So there are two reasons why animals have horns. Good question. We're going to turn now towards the west. As we turn to the west, uh, we are going to go over to Lauren. I am driving Mendoza. I'm taking a big risk. It's a road that we don't normally drive. And I always tell... Sorry, everyone. There's talk of lions down south. I don't know how visible they will be to us. Oh, I'm on my way down south too. Apparently James is also there. Um, okay. Is it the Cheetah Plains entrance? Okay, they were just talking about something near Baboon Pan. We're heading south anyway. There's two radios going. I don't actually quite know how to fix this radio, so I'm listening to two different channels. But I'm heading south anyway. Kukumuri loves this road, and I can see why it's actually perfect in so many ways for a leopard. So we're just having a little scratch around. Painted wolf, you're asking what is the thing <laughs> on the front of the car? That thing is a tracker seat. We are currently using what most lodges would use. This is a Mahindra. I am not going to lie to you all. I rarely lie that I don't love this vehicle. It's not my most favorite thing in the world. It's actually doubled over. So you can pull the top part up so it sits like an actual seat. Sorry, Owen, I just whacked you in the face with a branch. I'm so getting used to this vehicle. And that's where the tracker normally sits. So all lodges will have a driver, a guide, 
sitting exactly where I'm sitting right now in the same position driving and guiding but then in this seat at the front you will have a tracker who sits right on the edge and he gets the perfect view of tracks so if you look at where I'm sitting and I'm a small human it's very difficult for me to see over the bonnet so yes I can see what well, sun to deal with all sorts of things to deal with and it's not so easy for me to pick up tracks. I find it easier to do this. I think Trishala was doing it yesterday and I'm loving it. I'm loving resting my arm here as if I'm cool. You know, these cool dudes that drive like this, I'm not cool at all. But I can see on the ground. I can actually see tracks this way. Whereas over the front of the bonnet is much more tricky. And therefore that's where the tracker sits. But we don't normally use this vehicle. This is our this is our staff bumble other vehicle that we don't use for live drives. But of course, as you know, we're having a bit of a melt down with Rusty and Jigga. And therefore we're using this for the time being. Owen is doing a fantastic job. Can I just say this? The setup that the cameraman has on this vehicle is not easy not one little bit so i just want to say owen is doing a sterling job of managing it on this vehicle but we got to do what we got to do and we must provide entertainment for you all many of you are wondering if the tracker seat is dangerous i could possibly jump out and give you a preview essentially oh this is going to be awkward i forgot my door actually doesn't work <laughs> So this may be slightly tricky. I'm going to have to climb over the bonnet, yes. This car is full of weird and wonderful things. There we go, this is the easiest way to access it. So essentially it could be dangerous if you think of it, but it's not. Most trackers are highly, highly experienced. So it folds up like this, and I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm gonna show you how it works. You will only see my back though. So you sit like this and it's actually very, very comfortable. Oh, and do you fancy driving and doing camera work at the same time so I can sit here? Yeah, absolutely. That's so comfortable. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it like this, except the car's just not going to go anywhere. <laughs> okay, Owen's going to drive for a few seconds. He's locking the camera. Owen, you be careful. Precious cargo here. But yes, you're going to see how it rolls. Now, essentially, your legs are dangling. My legs are dangling free. So lions, leopards, elephants will come right to the car. And the first person they're going to meet is in the tracker seat. But you have to remember, the trackers out here are the likes of Herbie, Rickson, Morris. Really experienced people that know how to handle these situations. I'm a bit scared now. I feel like I need to put my seatbelt on. Okay, Christian's staying on now. Oh, oh and slow down. Oh, I'm gonna drive like this. Kirsten's saying I now need to track something. It's rather liberating, but I can see everything, absolutely everything on the ground. If there's a track to be seen, you can see it from this position. And that's why it's, how do I phrase this? I need to be careful how I phrase this. Those who have worked in lodges, I have not. Maybe James can give his sort of experience in this. See, working at Wild Earth is actually more difficult than driving for a lodge because when you drive for a lodge, yes, you're a guide and you've got to speak to your guests, but you don't really track. You have a tracker to do all the tracking for you. When you're at Wild Earth, woo, <laughs> you have to talk to the camera, answer questions, listen drive and track so it's a lot of people we've had ryan from arethusa i think dylan's maybe come and gave it a go from chitwa many others and they say it's tricky it's really really tricky to do what we do but maybe i'm just biased <laughs> kirsten says she's loving it i'm loving it too thanks owen <laughs> but if we see an animal then we don't have a cameraman but it's actually very, very lovely. I have a great view and I don't have to worry about driving. I just have to worry about those low hanging branches. But this is essentially how it works. And that, ooh, that's how the lodges can really, really track. Not only are they experts, full of knowledge, been doing it for years, they get the perfect view down in front of them. They really do. And of course, in a sighting with a predator or an elephant or an elephant herd, you have to be very, very careful. You have to be really, really careful what you do because essentially you're exposed. 
This is fun. <laughs> Christian's asking have I found a leopard. Just you wait. Just you wait. I will sit in the seat and I will find a leopard. Wouldn't it be lovely if one was just on a termite mound over there? Sadly, it's not. This is the first time I've actually experienced a tracker seat. It gives you a completely different perspective. Huh. I'm not saying I'm going to find anything, but still. Hukamori, if he was in the property, I can tell you he did not come in via Mendoza. There's not one single track on this road. So I would imagine he came in via Balanites or power lines. Jules, I forgot about that. <laughs> she says, watch out for spider webs. Oh yes, I didn't think of that. Oh, and if you drive me into any golden orb web spiders, we will no longer be friends. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, there's always the element. I think on roads, smooth roads like this, Mendoza's quite smooth, although it's completely overgrown. It's easy. Off-roading, I have seen people following very mobile leopards through all sorts of drainages and really thick bush with the tracker on the tracking seat. And that's, I think, when it would be very scary to be a tracker. You've got to guide, you've got to direct, and you've got to look. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm definitely saying you get a fantastic view here. You really do. Totally different perspective. Maybe I shouldn't be so harsh on the Mahindra all the time. <laughs> oh, I like that. Kirsten said, okay, tracker Lauren. I'm going to send you across to driver Jake. Yes, driver James cannot be tracking. He is doing both. He's driving and tracking, isn't he, David? Yes. I think that's very innovative of Lauren. Well done. I'm sure Owen enjoyed it too. I have not found any tracks that I think are worth following, I must confess. Nor have I found any mammal. So, I did sit with a two-pip policeman for a little while. But Lauren had just started her segment, and so we sat with the two-pip policeman for a little, and then it went away, and so we also went away. A two-pip policeman is a butterfly, in case you're wondering. No, sorry. Still not. You better tell me, David. Yeah? Oh! Oh, there's a two-pip policeman on that Venonia, which apparently has another name, but they haven't decided what it is yet. Thank you, Judy H. Here, on the purple flower here. Can you see it there, Dolph? Just right here, oh, next yeah. to the silver Sorry. cluster laugh. Um, I think that it's probably, I don't know, I'm, I have three cups of coffee a day. That's my limit. There is a two-pip policeman. Lauren has two. Lauren has two only? Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. You sure? She's downscaled. So she has nothing when she gets up? Yes, one when she gets up. One when she gets up? Uh, and breakfast? No, no coffee. Uh, no coffee at breakfast. No, that's where I have my other one. Um, yes, there you can see the two pips on the two-pip policeman. I think there are worse things in the world to have than coffee, especially if you don't have it with any sugar or milk. Not that I think the milk's a major issue. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to cut down on my three cups of strong black coffee every day. There's also a purple pansy, blue pansy there, that's the one. Some of you guys, like James Richard, would have done your nuts in the Kalahari. We had fields of this pink hare's tail plant full of different species of blues. And we had grass jewels, I remember that. We had um, monarchs, obviously. Definitely brown-veined whites. We had, um, I'll try and remember some of the others too. 
beautiful range of butterflies in this gorgeous pink vegetation. That's a really nice shot we have there. These vanonias are really quite productive to sit at. my app out. Vernonia. Actually, I do not know if a caterpillar will be a butterfly or a moth. I am actually, until it pupates and either forms a cocoon or doesn't, uh, moths make cocoons, butterflies don't. I don't know how you tell the difference. That is the blue pansy in all its glory. Fairly common butterfly. Ooh. Lauren has now got an animal on full display. I have a magnificent animal, James, known as a kudu. A female kudu and another female kudu showing off. Hello, love. <laughs> I love it when they stand on top of the termite mounds. I really, really love it. I think they are just great. And we actually went through a number of weeks, if not months, without seeing kudu. And it, it appears that they're everywhere again, which is good news. I love kudu. James had a cuckoo the other day, and I linked, we're going to go across to James with a kudu. Kudu, cuckoo, sounds quite similar on the radio, you know. Same, same, but different, exactly cursed, exactly. Same, same, but different. What are you doing up there, madame? I am guessing she hasn't by that face. It doesn't look like the face that's seen a leopard. Uh, oh, apologies, my game drive's going. They were all talking about beer on the game drive earlier. Yes, that's the nonsense that we have to suffer through. So was Mr. Hendry throwing me under the bus with my coffee cups? I have actually reduced. I do have one cup in the morning, but I'm going to show you the... <laughs> Javi had my back. Thank you, Javi. He's obviously after something. I'm going to show you the size of my cup, Owen. So I do have one cup in the morning. It's very, very strong coffee. A lot of people cannot handle it. But the cup is this size. <laughs> So I say one cup, but actually to the average person, that's probably two full cups inside one cup. But I am trying to reduce. I did start to get heart palpitations and I was slightly worried. I didn't know if it was stress or all sorts. I'm going to bumble onwards, Owen. So I remember discussing this with my colleagues and it was actually David Hancock who said, Lauren, he's such a lovely, lovely gentleman. You are drinking too much coffee. And I thought, oh... Is it not stress? And he, uh, hi. Hello, ladies. You look very pretty. Very pretty. He said, yes, Sonia, you're eating far too... You're not eating, you're drinking far too much coffee. You must reduce. So I thought, right, I'm going to listen to David Hancock. And I think he was right. Because my coffee is so strong, I was drinking too much. So I have actually reduced. But I feel like we need to go back to David Easto and ask him. He probably managed to get out of that one quite, oh, quite well. But I can assure you, he drinks a lot of cups of coffee. Mm hmm. Darby drinks a lot. <laughs> what are you looking at us like that for, lady? That's a very good point, Louise. Thank you. Owen, what time was your last coffee last night? I actually know the answer to this because he just told me. When did you drink your last coffee? 
He's gone yeah. silent. Was it at one o'clock this morning? No, rubbish. Is that rubbish? Yeah. Okay. When was your last coffee? About eight thirty. Eight thirty nine. I've seen Owen drink coffee at nine o'clock at night. Can you believe it? I do not know how anyone does that. I could never even contemplate sleeping, drinking coffee at night. And I have actually shared the story about my mother with you all, but my mother used to drink a lot of coffee in a day. She was a teacher. She caught herself drinking 16 cups of coffee, but the small cups, you know, the, these cups, you can barely get your finger in the hole. And yes, Kirsten, one, six, 16. But this very small, not a mug, a cup with those small, small, tiny little holes for your fingers. It was that size of cup, but she used to drink 16. And she had a few medical problems and she went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh my goodness, you cannot drink that amount of coffee. Elaine, so she has switched to decaf, which I also think is rather absurd and she drinks a lot less. So you do have to be careful with coffee, but sadly it is absolutely delicious and I love it. And James Hendry, his pot is the only other pot that I trust in camp. Davy's getting there, but you know, he's still learning, poor soul. What was that one? Coffee's vital. It is when you work in this job, let's head to the den. When you work in this job and you have to get up at early o'clock, I need my coffee injection. But there's some people's pots I will not touch. I almost make sure I know who's made the pot before I drink the coffee. And James Hendry, sadly, I hate to give him a compliment, meets the mark. Bye bye, ladies. <laughs> oh, it appears like James has found his favorite animal a beefalo. I'm not sure it's my favourite animal, but it is a beefalo. I'm 99.999% sure that it's exactly the same beefalo you've seen already today. Not sure why there should suddenly have been in such an influx of beefalo. But it's quite nice to see one, isn't it? Yes, I'm pretty sure that this is the buffalo. Kirsten says it looks quite similar to the other one. In so much as they both had horns. Thank you, Kirsten. You may now be quiet. You can also hear Kirsten's favourite ducks calling. Kirsten, have we ever related the story of your duck-owning parents and how that hasn't always been such a good thing? So, what was the kind? What was the duck they bought? So, her parents bought a. Something called a Carolina duck. And this rather exotic looking greenish creature was in a box. And everyone was very excited for the unveiling of this exotic duck. They built a pond for it and it was going to live in abject luxury, I tell you. And so, on the day of the unveiling, Kirsten walked down with her telephone to shoot the unveiling, the removal of this, or the arrival of this wonderful duck to its new salubrious digs in Westville, KwaZulu-Natal. And um, as the box in which the duck was being transported was opened, the duck shot out at a speed probably roughly the same as a bullet being fired from a high-caliber hunting rifle and it flew over the wall and was never seen again. <laughs> and that is the story of the Carolina duck and it is the most wonderful video. It's hilarious. I don't know where it ended up. Probably as duck l'orange on someone's plate. 
Oh, and then they, sorry, carry on. Yes, you bought another one, and then what happened to that one? Didn't the dog eat that one? Oh, yes. Yes, in fact, the first time that I went down to Kirsten's house to meet the family, she took me to the duck pond where they'd put another one of these Carolina ducks. And as we opened the gate and went into the ponded area, this thing took off again at the speed of a hunting rifle's bullet and was never seen again. Different duck. <laughs> I'm not sure what the moral of that story is. I'm sure there is one, though. I do wish that this buffalo would lift its head so that we could see its eye slightly. There we are. Come on. Yes, most comments, the buffalo here are most certainly different from the ones that occur in Asia. This is the Cape buffalo, and the ones in Asia are known as the Asiatic water buffalo. And the Asiatic water buffalo is a much more um, confiding creature than this. So the Asiatic water buffalo can be domesticated, and they are used for milk production, for ploughing, for all sorts of things. But uh, this chap is not the same. Trying to milk him, well, you would never try and milk him, would you? But trying to get him to tow a plough would be a very dangerous exercise indeed. starting to fall here at Juma Private Game Reserve. Oh, there we are. Lots of activity now. Up you get. Come on, time to eat. I thought we'd want to a shot of his eye. Okay, Chris, that's a good idea. You say he looks down in the dumps and we should give him a compliment. I will do that, exact thing. Mr. Buffalo, Mr. Buffalo, I know that things might seem a little rough at the moment, but I'm going to tell you two things that will help keep your spirits up. The first thing is that you are not a member of Homo sapiens or indeed of Felis domesticus, and therefore you cannot contract the coronavirus. So that is excellent news for your day. The second thing I'd like to tell you, Mr. Buffalo, is that you're very, very good looking. Although many have told you you look like an outsized, muddy and stinking cattle, you are not. You are in fact a magnificent brute of immense power and strength, and I am most impressed by you. Hmm. See? Now oh, he's quite happy. He's feeling better now, isn't he? <laughs> I, sh I think we've done enough here. We've had not one question about a buffalo. I find that is generally the case with most buffalo sightings, actually. People kind of want to see them, but, you know, the, then it's done. Uh, do you know, Kirsten, if Lauren is going to go into the hyena den in the Mahindra?
No, no, I think that's absolutely fine. I was just um, thinking about it if she's not going. No, no, she can go for sure. That's no problem whatever. I will get some pictures of those cubs at some stage. Hopefully she'll get one today. <laughs> Vicky, you say, please help me, I can't stop laughing. I'm very pleased, Vicky. It is uh, most encouraging that you found my little buffalo story. I'm assuming that's why you're laughing. My little buffalo story. I hope it's why you're laughing. While we drive along here, um, who is cooking supper tonight? Trish. Trish. And it's poiky, is it? Apparently. Stew. Ooh. A combo. Rusco Indo Ruscan stew. Should be good. We made roast chicken last night, Kirsten and I. I think I did most of the work, actually. In fact, I think I did all of the work, didn't I? Yes, I did. I put the chickens in. You peeled one potato and I peeled all the rest. You may chop them up, I'll give you that. I made the white sauce. You put a couple of pieces of broccoli in a bot the bottom of a pan onto which my white sauce went. I grated all the cheese. I started the oven. I started the stove. I took the chickens out. I took out the potatoes. Now you did put some flour and oil on the potatoes. I'm going to give you about 10%. You get 10% of the effort for yesterday's supper. Kirsten says marriage is 50-50. Well, then I suggest you start living to that. <laughs> marriage is not 50-50 only in name, in action also. Chicken tenders, which animal would be the best chef in the animal kingdom? Well, given that we're the only animal in the world that cooks anything, I don't think that there are many that would be very good chefs. But I suppose that if, uh, you know, one was thinking of flavors and different kinds of flavors, the, the omnivores would be the best chefs. Baboons, monkeys, some bird species, I suppose. Civets, maybe. I would probably go with the monkey though. Oh no, a baboon. Although the thought of eating what a baboon eats is really quite offensive. There's a wart pig, David. Do you see it? It's a small grey shape through the bush there. Just the other side of the fire break. You got him. What a sighting this is, hey? Oh my goodness. Look at that. Kirsten saying that this is one for David's showreel, it's such an amazing shot. Ah, I must agree. <laughs> How exciting. Hear it going. I gave a bit of movement to the shot there, David. Very creative. Hmm. Now we get the 
side shot. Fantastic. It's almost overwhelming. I especially like the way that the light is catching the grass, which really takes the eye away from the f warthog that is standing in full shade. Super zoom. Mm. You can, I suppose, see the excellent set of warts. Ah, now movement through the beautiful trees that are Strychnos madagascarensis. And now the subtle movement of just the grass. Hmm. Well, my earpiece has died yet again, so I think what I'm going to do is place it on the road in front of me and run it over. <laughs> While I do that, over to Lauren and Rebon. I know the feel, James, the earpiece. That's not my most favorite item. Now, I'm not sure I've positioned very well for this sighting. We do have a ribbon, and I don't have a monitor, so I have actually no idea what you can see. Owen, are you happy with this? No, yeah, ah, Kirsten's saying you can see a ribbon. I do feel if we go through here, we'll actually be looking at our side on, but the reason that this angle appeals to me, it might not be great right now, but we have got a great view of A, her fat tummy and her nipples. And why we want to see the nipples is because we want to see the little cubbies come out. Now, there was another vehicle here. We just chatted to them and they said it's actually the land, the lodge manager. Don't worry, this den's been kept a little bit quiet for the time being because the cubs are so young and the cubs have not popped their head out just yet. So what time are we at? We are at 5.30. This is starting to get cooler. Oh, it's a tail. <laughs> I saw a black something, it's Ribbon's tail. They will come out, they will suckle. So I think it's just a case of having patience. And I know many of you think, oh, we're back with Ribbon again and she's not doing much. But essentially, this is how it started. I remember doing, I think, three bushwalks. One was with you, Owen, just looking at Dens, thinking, oh, another termite mound, everyone. Oh, another termite mound, fantastic. Another termite mound. It wasn't the most interesting. That's not a cub, is it? Is that a tail? It's a tail, yeah. It's a tail, okay. And, but eventually you get the answers. You've just got to stick with it. The one thing I will say I have learned about, well, being at Wild Earth is patience. Patience with wildlife. It will always deliver. You've just got to have the patience with it. As many of you know, we spend hours and hours on hours talking well, mostly nonsense and not essentially finding animals, but when it pays off, it pays off and we do get there. Yes, cursed. I have a feeling we'll see the cubs too. And if she does not move, we are in the prime position. Can you see that nipple? That is massive. That is one lactating mama right there. And we'll, I think we'll see them. So we just need to be really, really patient on this one. I've followed the ribbon story since the start. And I have to say, it's just been such a joy, especially during these quieter days of summer. And with everything else that's going on in the world, it's been such a joy to discover that our old matriarch here is a mama. I think we're in for a wave of, of great times for the Juma clan. It's been very rough. There's no other way to describe it. It's been very rough for them. And Owen and I were actually just chatting about the Juma clan, discussing the turmoil that we heard in camp one night. Kirst, you were there as well. James was there. Jamie was there. Everyone came out of their room in their pajamas. And my goodness, that was the night everything changed. The night that June was attacked. Yes, a crazy night. I'm not sure if Corks was there that night, but that was the night that everything went down. And this old girl here took over. Oh, Darcy Ann, thank you so much. You appreciate my patience and I appreciate yours. One day is going to change. One day we're going to come here and these cubs are going to be very active and probably very defiant. 
ignoring mother's instructions and running around like little Torags. That is going to happen one day. Torag is a Scottish word, I think. And it means just a little young troublemaker. And that will happen. And what I'm intrigued to see, we're documenting this, we're documenting everything, is when that change will come. When does Ribbon allow other clan members to come close? When exactly to the day? I believe the Cubs were born on the 27th of March. And when do the Cubs have those full open wide eyes? when will they properly start to walk when all these stages in development we will get to witness and that's why we come here although ribbon's not being very cooperative today shall we say that's the reason we come and she's seven years old she was born in 2013 she's essentially in her prime and i guess 2020 is a year for ribbon low ranking no more Andrew Corks is still around. Absolutely. We've seen her recently. And I think it was with Trishala. She actually saw Corky and Ribbon interacting quite intimately, shall we say. So I think what's happened with Corky is she was overthrown. She was very much put in her place. I don't know where she sits in the hierarchy now. And that's actually what I want to understand. We, I think we pretty much established the hierarchy before. And I'm going to go through all this with my maps and diagrams in the next few days. And I don't quite know where she sits now. But essentially, in order to survive, you have to please the matriarch. You have to be submissive to the matriarch. So I think what Trishala witnessed was Corky acting submissively to Ribbon. And that's what needs to happen. In order to be in Ribbon's good books and respect the queen, shall we say, Corky needs to be submissive now and just get over it. <laughs> and slot into the hierarchy somewhere. I'm just not sure where. What was that, Owen? I do not see what you are looking at. The Fox Club? Uh-huh. I'm not 100% sure what Owen is saying right now, but I shall find out and repeat it a little bit later. I'm also intrigued to know when Ribbon will move from this den. I don't know when it will be, but she will. She will pack up and move. And essentially, when you speak about hyenas, they have a natal den, and then they move to the communal den. Now, this used to be the communal den. So I'm intrigued to, to see whether Ribbon will actually stay here and make it the communal den, or whether she will move. The day we come here and Ribbon doesn't appear, and we don't hear any squeaks of cubs, we will know that she's probably moved, and we'll have to start the den search once again. Come on, little cubbies. I think we've got about a half an hour window here. So, of course, if there's even a smidgen of a cub sighting, you will be right back with us. But for now, we are going to send you back across to Mr. Hendry, the world's best driver. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, the world's greatest driver. <laughs> Something no one who's ever actually physically driven with me would agree with. Um, I think this is a perfect time to be at the den, so with any luck, I'll crash cut away from me back to the den site. We have seen spectacularly little since last we saw you after that unbelievable warthog sighting. We're now driving on Mendoza Road, which is a road on which I have seen spectacularly little in general. I run along this road often. I've seen elephants on it running once or twice, rhinos once or twice. Otherwise, it's a road that looks like it should be covered in interesting animals because there's good grazing, it's up on a ridge crest, and very seldom is there anything at all. 
There's a Steenbok pear that lives near the top, I'll tell you that too. Hello Katie from Scotland. The last time we had a cheetah sighting was just before the Rinderpest in 1894. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, it must have been that... I mean, I'm assuming it's that mother and two cubs. Which must have been about... eight months ago? I'm guessing eight or nine months ago. I had them. And then I think I think Ralph was still here. I think Ralph then had it. Ralph found them on foot first. Yeah, definitely not this year, says Louise. No, I, I don't think so. It's just the wrong habitat. So a nice cheetah in the Kalahari. Good habitat for them there. And because everything tends to concentrate on the rivers, you got a good chance of seeing cheetah. We saw five different cheetah there, which was really quite a good return, I thought. <laughs> oh, James. Such a beautiful view of the bird that Trishala mentioned this morning. The African hawk eagle. My earpiece is now drilling a small hole in the back of my back. Ah, apparently Steve had three shy males. I don't know when that was. Thank you, Michael, for that. And that was in August, on the 18th of August. I remember something about that. Yes, Ashley. James is chewing on grass. Does this offend you? I like it. It makes me feel happy. But if it offends you, I shall stop. reason to work out here that I can chew on grass, you know. Now we are approaching the top of Mondorza Road, where true to form there has been absolutely nothing. So let's go on to another road while you go back to Ribbon. Well done James for finding absolutely nothing. Good job. I didn't exactly do much for finding this hyena. She is in a rather predictable spot. But still, I'm winning on the animal front at the minute. <laughs> now, I keep seeing signs of movements and they're, they're, I think it's just a tail or I'm in a slightly disadvantaged position on this vehicle just so that the camera can be right on ribbon for the minute the cubs emerge, and I'm almost sure they will. They'll wake up, suckle, sleep. Wake up, suckle, sleep. The life of an infant. Michael, I knew you were going to say that. I could have predicted that Michael Fleetwood would say that. If she does move dens, and it's an if, it's highly likely, because that's generally how hyenas do it. They do have a natal den and then they move. But because the Juma clan's so small and because of the location, I'm just not sure. But generally, that's how it should be. So Michael's saying she may move to the other filaments dip dens which would be good for us. It's very close to us. It's easy to access. There's actually three that we know of, but there's probably a lot more in this area. So that's true. But Michael is, of course, hoping that she'll move to the Invubu den. He loves that one. It's his favourite den. I actually have had no hyena experiences there. I don't have any attachment to it, but it is a very beautiful termite mound. 
<laughs> Kirsten's saying it's a mansion. But you know who loves the Nvubu Den, I must say, is Tlalamba and Tingana. We regularly find them there, or they regularly walk through that game path. So would that affect Ribbon's choice? I am not sure. But of course, Michael, let's see. We shall see. Nobody knows who Ribbon's mother is. I've obviously been investigating this because I'm doing this big, beautiful diagram for you all. Please don't get your hopes up. And there was thoughts for a long time that it could potentially have been Corky. We don't know. We don't know really where Ribbon comes from. But we do know that she has had three litters that we know of, at least. Her first litter was actually born in around February 2017. And she had two cubs. One, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, is Antima, still with us today, three years old and gorgeous as ever. And the other one was called Lamula, another cub that sadly didn't make it. Beautiful name though, Lamula, but is no longer with us. So it was a twin litter and we still have Antima. The second litter that we know of was February 2019. And of course, this was two cubbies. One didn't make it, sadly, and I don't think we actually ever got to six it, believe it or not. And the other was Peddy, a little girl called Peddy, who is so stunning and so beautiful, very small for her age and essentially weak. And we believe she's also no longer with us. So out of four cubs, Ribbons only had success with Intima. And of course, we now have... Wow. We now have this litter that we have no idea about. I wonder what the sex ratio will be. Oh, Chris Rogue, you're saying Gwen is Ribbon's mother. Okay, I'm actually just going to note that down as we speak. Okay. Gwen is Hart's mother, so they are for Hart and Ribbon must be related. Gwen was last seen in November 2017, which is quite a while ago. Huh. Interesting. Thank you, Chris Rogue. Very much appreciated. Okay, the wait is on. We are losing light, but of course we're not going anywhere. You guys are. You're going back across to James. We have got the ground scraper fresh. Yeah. Beautiful. Sunlight shining off its back. Now all we need is for it to call. Now it is looking to the sunset. Trotting along. There's something very marvellous about this because these birds don't normally let you look at them for anything like this length of time. What are you doing, David? Going to the oh, the sunset. Okay, fair enough. Good idea. Hmm. Well, thank you, Sharona. You said I could take over from David Attenborough. I'm afraid nobody will ever take over from that fellow. I don't think there'll ever be another David Attenborough. There'll be others who do different things. Um, but I don't think anyone will reach that level of iconic status with great success. Beautiful picture there, the Drakensberg Mountains off to the far west. The sun slowly starting to sink on yet another wonderful day in Africa. David, is there a reason that your catering equipment has made it into the front of the car where I am sitting? Oh, 
Anyway, as I was saying this morning, I said, being at the hyena den made me feel rather grounded. Grounded in the fact that nature is continuing despite the turmoil surrounding human beings at the moment. And this is another one of those moments now. nature is really just carrying on, almost oblivious, not in a callous way, totally oblivious and uncaring, also not in a callous way, of the trials that we are surviving, or not surviving, sadly, in some cases. Ah, a number of you asking about my book reading tonight. So, I will be doing a bedtime story this evening at 8 o'clock, Central African time. Please don't ask me to try and work out what time that is where you are in the world, because my brain is too small to do that. So, an hour and a half after the end of drive, I will do a little reading. And we'll do it every evening at 8 o'clock, Central African time, uh, every weekday evening and I shall read from the book, Reggie and Me. And we'll see how far we get by the end of the lockdown period. Louise wants to know if she can come and watch live. You mean in my bedroom, Louise? I'm not sure that I won't be too intimidated by the pr presence of Tommy Shelby staring at me through my window. <laughs> okay, Louise, you can come. She just did a fist pump, apparently, and went, yes. <laughs> it's on Instagram, by the way. I actually don't know how we're going to make that work, but uh, we'll figure it out. It'll be a live Instagram feed, first one we've done, uh, which I assume will probably go to Facebook at the same time. And I will try and archive it. I will definitely try and archive it, absolutely. And I will also try and at some stage get it onto YouTube, although I'm really not sure I'm going to make that work. Unless I record it twice, but I don't want to do that. Magic Dragon Wizard, you want to know what time 8 a 8 p.m. Central Africa time is on Mars? Um, how long is a Martian day? Isn't it something ridiculous like four hours no it's not I don't know how long a Martian day is so you know the hour of 8 o'clock is 20 hours out of 24 which is what fraction what percentage is 20 out of 24 goodness gracious my mind is swimming 20 out of 24 is the same as 10 out of 12 which is the same as 5 out of 6, so how do you work the percentage out from there? It's around about, I don't know, 85% of the way through the day on Mars, whatever time that is. Sun's gone now. Is that why you came back to me? You've done this before, haven't you, David? Let's carry on. We're going to backlink to Lauren and Ribon now. Ribbon. Oh. She just answered her name there. I'm convinced of <laughs> Ribbon, that cannot possibly be comfy. Please. <laughs> You're completely upside down. She's irritated by the flies. Oh. I don't know how anyone can think that hyenas are actually not cute. I think they're adorable. They really do remind me of domestic dogs. Facially.
Luxa Quinn. You're asking what's the difference between painty dogs and hyenas? Just want to make sure I got that question right before I start. Correct. They're completely different animals. So painted wolves are obviously wild dogs, depending on which name you prefer. I fully understand conservation trying to change that term. I just personally think wild dog is an epic name. But yes, I fully understand and support of changing the perception of wild dogs. People prefer to call them painted wolves. They are completely different species that belong to the canid group. There's 34 different species in the canids, including the Ethiopian wolves themselves. Dogs and all other wolves around the world make up the canid family. And canid is obviously dog-like. So when you speak about the, the wild dogs, they are obviously grouped together with features that are more similar to dogs. Whereas hyenas essentially are actually, in my opinion, I agree with this statement, they're behaviorally quite like dogs and morphologically quite like dogs, but very distantly related to them. They're more closely related to cats, feliforma, than they are dogs, caniforma. However, their closest relatives of all are the mongoose. Can you believe it? Mongoose are, of course, carnivores, and within the order Carnivora, hyenas are actually very closely related to mongoose. Neither cats nor dogs. But in terms of taxonomy and lineages, they're more closely related to cats than dogs. So wild dogs obviously belong to Kennedy, and hyenas are not in that group, but together they are essentially all part of the order Carnivora, which means carnivores. Hyenas are in their own little family called Hyenidae, and this consists of four different species. The spotted hyena that you're looking at right now, the striped hyena, the brown hyena, and the aardwolf. The four of them all come under that umbrella term Hyenidae, if you like. So wild dogs and hyenas are not closely related in the slightest. They're completely different. Kirsten saying there's lots of flies in her yard. Yes, I can't actually see that from here, but I remember looking at that this morning. I briefly popped in to FC and I could see the flies in her. I think she's got an injury there on her butterfly ear. Her left ear is a butterfly ear. It looks like the shape of a butterfly. <coughs> and <coughs> I'm sorry everyone for coughing. That's also not pleasant. And I think there's a small injury there. And the flies are very attracted to this wound and it's irritating her. Okay, the waiting game continues. As we wait for these black little bears, we're going to send you across to James, who has finally found an animal. Yes, it's behind a bush now, naturally. I have decided to wear my new hat. What do you think? <laughs> it's great. Do you like it? Yes. There's the the elephants come out. My wife says I look ravishing. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> mm. I've taken it off now because it's rather heavy. I think that I have seen this little pair, mum and son, here before. And it was a very hot day. And there's a pan here, quite close by. And they were sitting in the pan together, just the two of them. And then they were acted in much the same way as they are now. A little bit nervous, not terrified. Moved away slightly. And he was, you know, at the time he was a little bit far from his mum. And as soon as we came by, he made sure to close the distance between them for security. Now they're very peaceful. Hello Barry, my scariest encounter with an elephant. I think 
I think two stick in stick out in my mind. They were both a long time ago, both at Angala, both with the same elephant. And I was driving guests, which always makes you know things slightly more terrifying because you're in charge of their lives. And we were watching a herd of elephants, and the matriarch sort of came out of the riverbed towards us, and she I could see she had a tusk that bent underneath her mouth. And Elvis, the tracker, knew the elephant, and he said, back up, back up. And he never panicked or never raised his voice, never even showed the slightest animation. And he quickly said, back, 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 back. And I was driving a Land Rover, a four-cylinder, ancient thing with no power steering, and I couldn't get it in gear. And she came, she just came straight at us for no reason. We were a long way away, much further, than, say, double the distance from that elephant. And... I found that absolutely terrifying. We obviously got out in time, but uh, that was one. And then another time, same elephant, we were just driving slowly. I was chatting away to the guests, and I suddenly heard Elvis hit the bonnet of the car, and he said, Famba, 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 which means means go, go, go. And I thankfully, I didn't ask a question. I just dropped a gear and floored it. And we drove off at high speed, and I looked behind me, and there was the same elephant, totally silently, coming herring out of the bush, trying to cut us off, and hit the car. She didn't hit the car, thankfully. We got away. But, uh, yeah, those are the two probably scariest elephant moments. Haven't had, touch wood, anything like that of late, because the animals or the elephants are just so much more relaxed than they were, say, 20 years ago, when I started doing this sort of a job. Right, on we go. Don't have to do another blow on my earpiece. What did she say? Back to Lauren. Okay, back to Lauren. Sadly, I'm not sure how lucky we are gonna get with the puppies today. I think it really depends on their sort of feeding routine at the moment. We just have to be lucky, and I think Darby and I got so lucky the other day with that visual of the two of them. Now, there's, it's really been a sort of cloudless day in the sky, which means that it will take a little bit longer to get darker. But once we really do lose too much light, we will not stay here, not at all. So I'm just hoping we get even the briefest view. She's just doing a very good job at protecting them. She really, really hasn't left us to inside much. I imagine she will wander at night time, I really do. But other than food and water, I think Ribbon will be here. Always. For the next foreseeable. And what I can't wait to get my head around really is who sits where in the hierarchy between the females. With the males, that's slightly irrelevant. They don't really have a hierarchy, but you will be able to see who they are closer to. But essentially what I'm really looking forward to seeing is out of the females, who sits where? Who's the lowest ranking female now? I'm really not sure. Is it Corks? Has she gone from the top to the bottom? Just like that? Is it June? I think Ribbon Heart and Antima will be at the top. Kayla, generally speaking, when the cubs are this young, we would have to turn lights on in order to be able to see when we're driving. And I just don't think when the cubs are a handful of days old, if that, that it's sensible to be here when it gets dark. Once the cubs get slightly older, we will be able to be here when it's dark because we use the infrared light to see through the camera. And we've spent many a night at the den as long as there's an adult, as long as there's a babysitter. But I think when the cubs are this young, very, very young, we would not want to stay here when it gets dark. 
vehicles in order to for me to drive this beautiful vehicle that I am driving. I would have to turn lights on to get out of here to be able to see where I'm going. And I don't think that's fair on newborns. But once they get a lot more mobile than what we, they are right now, and they're very much sort of active outside of the den, then we'll make this, the decision to stay at night time as long as there's an adult. And I'm not talking about a human adult. I'm talking about a hyena adult. Sharena, you said you are new. Ah, welcome on board. And you said you have really fallen in love with the Juma clan, especially Ribbon, and you can't wait to sort of meet the rest of them and learn about the dynamics. I can't wait to show them all to you. The hyena sightings that we have had recently have been brief, fleeting, not what we used to have around the Dane site. At a communal den site, it's the most, I was actually just talking to Owen about this, it's the most wonderful, wonderful thing when you see all the hyenas in the clan, including the males, including the cubs, including the adults, all interact. It's really incredible. So I can't wait for you to see that too. You will love it. And it's coming soon. It's coming very soon. Again, we just have to be patient. But at least we know she's got two little cubbies now. And I knew it. Davi said to me, how did you know that? And of course, hyenas generally have twin litters. They have two functioning nipples. And therefore, they have two cubs. But the reason I knew that Ribbon actually had two inside there was when Davi and I were here that first time. And Ribbon was very uncomfortable. Something was going on. We could hear squeaks. I don't think we actually got them live. But we could hear very bizarre squeaks. Not squittering but strange newborn squeaks. And I could hear two squeaks from two different individuals, if that makes sense. I thought possibly I was going crazy. That's also, that's definitely possible. But I could hear squeaks from two different animals. And I just knew there was two inside there. They can give birth to one, a single cub. They can have a twin litter, and hyenas actually have been known to have three. But generally speaking, when they have three cubs, normally one dies. There's only two nipples, and there's such a strive for dominance within hyenas, within twin litters, that if you add a third one onto the mix, is the chance of survival is very, very low. They do not allow suckle like lions. There's been lots of sort of reports and records where a different mother will suckle the offspring from a different female. However, it's more to do with hierarchy and bullying, essentially. And Ribbon is a perfect example. So when Corky had Plonk, Corky was a matriarch. She was a leader. She was a queen. <laughs> You're listening now, aren't you? And Plonk, of course, was also very high ranking, very dominant, very boisterous, and, well, a little bully in the most loveliest way we actually saw ribbon suckling plonk once or twice and that's really not through choice that was through i am the lowest ranking female i have to keep the matriarch happy if plonk wants my nipple if plonk wants my milk i have to do it it wasn't really through choice and it's not in the same way that lions work in a pride through aloe suckling. It's more the lowest ranker just doing anything she can to keep the high rankers happy, if that makes sense. Oh, how the tables have turned since then. So you will see aloe suckling, but essentially using the word aloe suckle probably isn't the correct term. It's more forced suckling. <laughs> I don't think Ribbon's having a good day. I think she's a little exhausted, shall we say? As am I. So as we sit patiently that ever we are gonna send you back across to James. We are also sitting patiently, but we are moving forward while sitting patiently and seeing, well, what we can find. I will now use the spotlight. Oh. Oh, 
Oh, he's still alive. Oh. Well, as long as it didn't go blue everywhere else. Spotlight is superfluous currently. I can see enough into the bush. Hello, Slimming for Health. No, I don't think we're going to see lions tonight. I'm going to check one more place, but I think that they are too far to the north. Uh, they may come back, but I think they're too far north. We'll go and have a look-see near Sydney's Dam, which is the water hell right on the northwest corner of Juma. Yes, Mick and Gala does have something of particular interest. He's got white lions. So the Birmingham Pride's got some white lions in it. And uh, you, that'll be fantastic if we get to see those. That's the main thing. Otherwise, it has much more varied habitat than Juma because of its size. So there's Mapani felt in the north, which is very different. And then there's this broadleaf Cumbretum woodland type stuff, uh, which runs from sort of the central region, north of the Timbavati River. And then south of the Timbavati River, there is sort of uh, mixed red grass knobthorn savanna, which is a totally different habitat type. It looks completely different. And so there are three nice diff habitat types. And then there's also a major river that flows through it. So we don't really have a river that flows through Juma. We have the Mlalamati, which is a sort of um, dry brook, if you like. Uh, Ngala has the Timbavati River, which it doesn't flow. It flows, flows annually if there's good rain, so it would have flowed this year. But it is a magnificent, magnificent riverbed. It's about, I don't know, 60 to 100 meters wide in most places, and on its banks are these vast fig trees, jackalberry trees, uh, large-leaved albizias or false thorns. Uh, it's just spectacular. Mahoganies, gorgeous mahogany trees. And so if you drive along the riverbed there and look up into the trees, it's just it's made magical. And there's one section on the riverbed which is called Big Bend. And Big Bend is a sort of I suppose if the river had flowed for any longer would have become an oxbow, but isn't an oxbow. So it's basically a forest. It's, it's created a forest. Because the river bends around in a loop and the banks are so thick with trees, they've kind of joined up and it's this gorgeous forested area. I, I don't know if you'll get any signal in there. I'm not sure if the guys will take you in there, but it just gives you a totally different feel from what you get over here. So there's lots of different bits and pieces. Well, there are lots of di but different bits and pieces that Angala has to offer. Joy in Hong Kong, wondering about different types of antelope there. Mm, no. Same antelope. You're unlikely to see anything different species-wise. Uh, you may see different birds, but you won't see different mammals from the mammals that we see here. I mean, if we do night drives there, you should see lots of civets, actually, because we used to see civets all the time. I'm assuming they still do. Uh, but otherwise, no. Same antelope, species. Uh, no Nyala. I've, I think I saw Nyala twice while I was there. You do find bushbuck, impala, waterbuck, wildebeest, uh, kudu, that sort of thing. But very few Nyala for some reason, I'm not sure why that is. Nobody could ever answer satisfactorily there. Stienbock, Diker. Maybe, maybe, if you're very lucky, a sharp Schreisbock up in the Mapani. I don't know if they'll drive that far because I don't know if the signal will extend that far. A lot of it really does depend on how far the signal will extend. Well, it's a big, big piece of land, you know, it's 15,000 hectares which is 35,000 acres. So literally 10 times the size of Juma.
Right, Lauren is going to do one more segmenty with a ribbon and then she's going to press on and we will continue doing the pressing that we are doing now. <laughs> I'm doing one last seggy, as Patrick Fitzgerald would call it. James used to love that. Seggy. Yes, we're losing light. It's still light enough, essentially, but I just want to be sensible. Auntie Lauren here wants to look after those little cubbies, and it will be time to leave in a few minutes. So I just wanted to give you one okay, last... Ah, radio shushed. I just want to give you one last little view of our gorgeous queen, our gorgeous matriarch, and then eventually we will leave her be. I'm sad we didn't get to see the cubs, but they're obviously in that vital stage, a few days old, where milk is life. <laughs> Milk is all that matters. Suckle, sleep, suckle, sleep. They're, they've not got that sort of boundless energy that they can have when they get a little bit older. And they're still developing. They're not entirely mobile yet. I've watched that clip back maybe a hundred times. Darby said, oh, I've got so many views on my Instagram. And I'm like, yeah, it was probably mostly me. I can't stop watching it. And... You can see they're not very mobile and one gets sort of pushed over by the other one and it ends up falling flat on his face because they're not strong yet. But that will come and it will come soon. It comes a lot earlier in hyenas than it does in the likes of lions and leopards cubs. So it's just a patience game. But I think if we follow her each day, whether it's James, Trishala or I, whoever it is, just popping in, just checking she's okay, checking she's here, we're going to have a great story. And that's what it's all about, telling the story of the wildlife out here. So it's time to move, everyone. Good night, Ribbon. We shall come and see you tomorrow. So as I get out of here and head back to quarantine, we are going to send you back across to dreams. We have got zebras. Look at that. Three zebras. You thought there were only two and you thought I couldn't count, but actually I can. There are three. These you also find at Angala, of course. And in fact, in winter, in great number, on the red thorn, at least the red grass clearings. No, what was that? Mobile was... guides. Mm -hmm. stories off the radio where the zebras are from. Love our guides, you're wondering where all the zebras have gone. Well, I can tell you where three of them have gone. <laughs> They've gone in front of us. I don't know. I really don't know where they've gone. I, yeah, I find it quite confusing, I must say. I guess maybe they're in the Manileti with the buffalo on the basalt clearings that they have there. Maybe they just have taken a, taken offense at the granite clearings that we have here. Kirsten says the young zebra looks scary. That's because the infrared is reflecting out of its eyes, Kirsten not because it is a zombie zebra. Sounds like a movie right up there with Sharknado. Zombie zebra apocalypse. Never did you ever watch Sharknado? Hmm? Did you ever watch Sharknado? I did. You did? Yes. Great film, eh? Hey? Real classic. Yeah. Oh, here come the zombie zebras to get us. Hello, Ian, you say I found zebra for you. Yep, that was my first thought when I found the zebra. I thought Ian is going to be so happy. I really enjoy zebra and I enjoy spending time with them, but I find it difficult in these parts, mainly because there aren't any, but also because they disappear normally so fast. That one's almost leucistic, it's got so little striping on its backside. Just to kudu, these are plains zebras, or birchal zebras. Or this spe specific kind of birchal zebra. A kind of plain zebra is called a birchal zebra.
Mountain zebras we get both species in South Africa, do we? Yes we do. The Cape Mountain Zebra and the Hartmann's Mountain Zebra. Both of which do much better in drier conditions. Beck Kim, Jack Kim, sorry, earpiece problems again. You want to know the one in the front is pregnant or just well fed? Um, she could be pregnant. The youngster is old enough for her to be pregnant again. But remember that zebras always look fat. And this is a classic thing that you learn when you start guiding is that they look fat because they have a cecum, their hind, hind gut fermenters. And so that is where the gas from fermentation sits. It's in the hind gut, which is what makes them look fat. So she could be pregnant. I think the, her foal's probably slightly too young for that, but maybe she might be. They're walking in classic zebra formation with the wife in front, the foal in the middle, and then the stallion behind to try and ward off any attacks from behind. It's a very small little kinship group, that's what we call a zebra group. Right, thank you Lady Starfire. You say that Tesla is doing a happy zombie zebra dance right now. That's uh, very exciting for Tesla. Uh, Tesla, I don't think you should frighten yourself, however. I suppose you have got a bit of time before you go to bed. I'm just blowing out my earpiece, everyone. No, no, I'm blowing out my earpiece. I didn't get anything. No. What did she say? Oh, gosh. Linda Poli, you... <laughs> You say that you loved Sharknado. Right, well, I have to confess I didn't love Sharknado at all. And I think there were six of them made or something like that. Maybe four. I mean, uh, you know, I've tried to pitch concepts to people before. Potential broadcasters and investors and that sort of thing. And I I'm, I'm struggle to imagine the meeting into which somebody who'd come up with Sharknado walked and with, in seriousness pitched this idea of sharks being picked up in a tornado and then dumped on cities, etc. And the person sitting opposite him not saying, you've got to be joking. And instead of saying, you've got to be joking, saying, you know, I think that's a great idea. I'll give you the money for it. No, not only that, why don't we sign a deal where we make four of them? <laughs> what is that there, David? Is that another zebra? Or is it a bush? Oh, I can't see anything. Your field, I've got field monitor. I think it was a bush. No, 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 Kirsten, I did not watch Sharknado. I flicked through the television once and saw it was on, watched five minutes and quickly turned it off again. Kirsten doesn't believe me. She now thinks I'm a Sharknado uber fan. On we go. We'll start heading for home now, I think. Our Lauren Moore says she's going to have to watch Sharknado. Our Lauren Moore, unless you're in lockdown, there is absolutely no reason to direct yourself to Sharknado. Sorry, we broke up there a bit, apparently. I was just saying, Arlar Moore, unless you're in lockdown with absolutely nothing else to do with your life, Sharknado is, uh, is not something that you're missing out on, unless that's the kind of film that, uh, you know, really appeals to you. It appeals to some, because they made four. I wonder if Linda managed to watch all four of them.
Yes, maybe Lauren, who is more uh, marine than I am, is a greater fan of Sharknado. Well, Mr. Hendry, Sharknado is a fantastic topic. I love to talk about Sharknado. What on earth is a Sharknado? Please, everyone. Please, I refuse to watch that movie. I am very antsy, that movie. I discussed it the other day. Apparently, Davi has watched it. It is apparently about a tornado of sharks that come and eat you. <laughs> Based on a true story, according to Kirsten. Have you watched it, Kirst? <laughs> I have no words. And the reason I actually get quite passionate about this topic, because it stems from Jaws. It stems from Mr. Steven Spielberg's decision to take that book by Peter Henley or Hemsley or Peter someone. Hemsley. He is the one that wrote the book, Jaws, and Mr. Spielberg's. If you are watching Steven Spielberg, I apologize, but you made the wrong decision. You turned it into a horror movie, which of course led people to fear sharks. And I remember my brother was obsessed with Jaws 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I don't know how many Jaws there are. But I actually even went to Universal Studios in Florida and did the Jaws experience or whatever does not portray sharks in a nice light at all. In case anyone is a little bit concerned, just let me clarify. James may be concerned about this as well, since I'm the marine expert. There will never be a shark needle. Yes, just in case you're worried, there will never be a... <laughs> there will never be a tornado of sharks that come to your town or your city or your village. So do not worry, people. As a marine expert, I feel safe to tell you all of that. Stranger Things have happened. Yes, that's true. And I do love the series Stranger Things. But that's a different topic. I, I hate that movie. And it disgusts me that they made it, especially when sharks are in such severe decline. They estimate about 90% of the global shark population has gone. And that's just based on recorded catches of sharks. So all those unrecorded landings and unrecorded fishing, of course, will add to that number. So essentially, I can't even begin to guess how many sharks we have actually lost, but I imagine we don't have many remaining left in the wild. And it makes me incredibly sad that instead of having an educational tool to educate people about sharks, we have a movie called Sharknado. Hi everyone, good evening. So yes, that's not the best thing for sharks. However, please don't fret everyone, there is no Sharknado coming your way. I think we should all produce a movie about how awesome sharks are. How does that sound? They really are awesome. Once you start to learn about them, they may look slightly terrifying. I agree with that. But they're really awesome and they deserve a lot more credit than a Sharknado. But yes, see, I've mentioned this the other day on Drive as well, but Steven Spielberg actually apologized. He regretted his decision and he understands he contributed, as well as the book contributed to people's irrational fear of sharks and people's perception of sharks. So he publicly apologized and he's now a huge advocate for sharks. So you've got to give the man credit because I, yeah, he's probably watching me also. I've just got to backtrack. He now gives money to shark conservation and he advocates for them. That's very lovely of him. Thank you, Stephen. Just Hollywood, please stop producing these awful movies about tornadoes or sharks. Please. I said to Owen, I've got a funny feeling of a last minute leopard and I do. I feel it. I feel it in my bones. James, Richard, you also want a last minute leopard. I feel it. I don't actually know how many minutes we have left and I know it's not long. Five, five minutes and 18 seconds, everyone. Probably now five minutes and 14 seconds. Yes, I've got to get moving. We are long overdue a leopard sighting. We had fantastic wild dog sightings and all our luck has run out. So as I bumble on to find you the leopard that I will find, we're going to send you back across to James, who, well, he's driving. Yes, he is just driving. I don't have the feeling of a last-minute leopard, I'm afraid. I have the feeling of grass and trees. 
I don't mind seeing a snake in one of these trees. Snook. That was one thing I didn't tell you about this, I don't think. On our very last night. Did I tell you about this? I don't think I did. Our very last evening, the very last drive that we were going on, we were sitting with a sociable weaver's nest and we desperately wanted to see a Cape Cobra raiding one of these nests. And there didn't seem to be anything going on in the nest and I couldn't see what was going on because I was on the wrong side of the car. And my wife, who was filming, trying to get a slow-mo of a bird going into the nest, said, there's a snake! And there, on our very last drive, we spent a good 10 or 15 minutes getting relatively, I think, very nice shots of this Cape Cobra weaving its way in and out of a sociable weaver's nest. It's a sort of quintessential Kalahari scene. And, oh, wow, those snakes are quite something. They're the most amazing sort of burnt yellow color. And they go up into the trees and sociable weaver's nests. Just a stunning, stunning sequence of, uh, well, I mean, I hope it's a stunning sequence of shots, but it's a certainly stunning thing to see. We don't get that sort of thing here, because we don't have searchable weavers, but we do get snakes that like to live in trees, such as the boom slang, or tree snake. What was that, Kirsten? Sorry, wait. <laughs> Go again. Oh, yes. There was also a cobra living under the shade platform that we had at one of our camps. Thankfully, it didn't come out while we were sitting there quaffing G&T. Beastly cobra. And the Cape Cobra, of course, has a venom that is most likened to that of the black number. What was that, David? I've given up on this earpiece now. Not sure. You weren't paying attention, were you? Okay. Well, maybe she'll repeat herself. Two minutes left. Is that what she said? Unfortunately, our compressor does not function. What's that? Sparrow. Sparrow. If what he was successful? Cobra. The cobra was successful. Uh, I think so. In the one shot, it looks like it's got something in its throat. I suspect it probably was. They eat the eggs, apparently, and the hatchlings of the sparrows. Social, the weavers, sorry, the sociable weavers. It looks like such a nice place to live until you see a snake weaving its way around it. Quite phenomenal how the snake actually manages to hold on to the nest and stay in it and then poke its head up into all the little chambers. I got that much, I got 60 seconds. Tomorrow is another day, everybody, in case you were wondering. Uh, well, we hope it will be another day. Who knows what apocalyptic tragedy could occur during the course of the night. But uh, if it doesn't, we will see you again tomorrow at 05.30. And I will see some of you at 8 o'clock this evening. What was that? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, for a reading of Reggie and Me, a book by James R. A. Hendry. Right, that's it. I give up. Ten nine. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions and your comments today. I've had a lovely, entertaining, if slightly quiet drive. We'll see you in the morning.